Denny Hamlin wanted people to stop talking about his restart controversy, so he created more drama. Turns out Denny Hamlin and Marcus Smith have so much beef they could probably open up an Arby's at this point because the two of them went at it on Thursday night on Twitter. If you don't know who Marcus Smith is, he is the owner of Speedway Motorsports Incorporated, SMI. They own 10 current NASCAR tracks. They lease out Coda, so they're a big player in the NASCAR space. They, of course, are famous for Atlanta, Texas, Charlotte, Las Vegas, Bristol, uh, Sonoma, which we'll talk about here in a second. Dover, Nashville, and a couple other small ones, North Wilkesboro as well. So, like I said, big player in this. Well, obviously, yesterday, if you saw my previous video uh, that I put out last night, Sonoma just had a repave recently, and the repave did not go very well. It didn't take, in fact, and now they have major track issues where the pavement's coming up. And the first image that came out of it going down into turn 11, obviously, you can see a bit of a pothole here where the asphalt essentially has just moved away off, like just straight up slid off of where it was supposed to be down because according to all of the people in my comments, and again, thank you for all the uh, asphalt education because clearly I had none, they didn't put tack down or something along those lines after they milled the surface and when they paved the new one down, it didn't stick. So that caused this issue and Denny Hamlin went ahead on Twitter on Thursday night and decided to crack his knuckles and lob out a, um, a take a subtle jab at SMI, if you will. And he said, when paving on a budget goes wrong, North Wilkesboro is next. And now, that is a subtle jab at SMI, correct? Like, that is going right to the throat, uh, essentially. And he's a, there's a lot that goes into this, right? Tracks currently, underneath the current NASCAR TV deal, tracks get 65% of TV revenue. And I know there's some people that are probably shocked by that number. It is actually kind of bonkers at this point. And teams, especially team owners, they're not pleased with that. And that's a huge sticking point right now in the current negotiations between NASCAR and the teams is teams want a bigger chunk of that TV revenue. And right now, tracks get majority of it. And it doesn't really feel like they're reinvesting all that money they get back into the tracks. We've seen drivers and teams before comment on how like when they get to Texas, you know, the pixels are out in the giant video board. There's kind of trash everywhere. Every, nothing feels like it's been updated. Could probably use a repaint. Other tracks as well. I'm just using Texas as an example. So Denny's basically saying, you're pocketing all of this money. Why did your repave have this issue? Foul point. So Marcus responds in kind of like a really poorly worded tweet and maybe the most boomer tweet that you could think as well. He says, I'll delete this once Denny calls me. Well, why don't you just pick up the phone and be a man about it and just call Denny and be like, hey, man, here's what happened. Or here's at least my understanding of what happened based on my team on the ground right here. No, no, no. Didn't do that. Wanted to come out and puff his chest and try to, you know, clap back at Denny. This has been the week of Denny Hamlin. So maybe Marcus is just tired of it as well. Well, it didn't stop there. And Denny responded and he kind of came over the top and he said, we've seen your reconfiguration record, basically referencing the Texas failure, the Kentucky failure. Some drivers don't like Atlanta. And there's a whole list of SMI things. We'll get into that in just a minute once we wrap up the Twitter drama here. All right, those are all valid points by Denny, right? We've seen the reconfiguration record. It doesn't really hold up. So, you know, maybe we don't listen to Marcus. Marcus then decides to get personal because that's what people do when they get backed into a corner. So he comes out and he calls out Denny Hamlin for not having a championship, which is honestly the most low-hanging fruit. We all make fun of Denny having not having a championship. It's just a fun thing to make fun of at this point. It's not like Denny doesn't know it. He's addressed it multiple times on his podcast. So he comes at Denny and calls him out for not having a championship while also being besties with NASCAR's most famous driver who doesn't have a championship in Dale Earnhardt Jr. So that was a bit odd right there. Dale's probably sitting at home going, well, I don't have a championship either. So, of course. So then Denny fires back like it's the championship final at Wimbledon and he's going for match point. And basically in different words saying, you're Nepo, baby. Don't ruin what your dad gave you. What he actually said was, here's a tip. Let someone else run your business before you blow everything up your dad gave you. Yeah, you're going after him for being a Nepo baby, going after his business acumen, and also kind of throwing a little bit of, not throwing shade at his dad. His dad built all of this. So then Marcus, of course, deflects. We don't want to talk about the actual issue in that previous tweet. Instead, he said he's proud of his dad. His dad's a NASCAR Hall of Famer, and his dad had a Twitter account and still alive. He would have eviscerated Denny Hamlin. It wouldn't have been family friendly. It's just, dad's just a bad, badass guy like that that is his dad didn't really uh was never a person to mince words so i will say that and this is just a classic like my dad's tougher than your dad type of situation and then of course again mocks denny hamlin for not having a championship once again low-hanging fruit denny's very aware of that 
And then Marcus feels some regret. This is all happening on Thursday night still. Marcus feels a little bit of regret. And he responds saying that he was just sticking up for all of his employees who were certainly sitting at home Thursday night having absolutely zero idea that any of this was happening, more than likely. Except for the PR team because they opened up Twitter and they looked like Troy Barnes in Community. And they were like, oh man, we got to figure this out. Because then the sun rose on Friday morning and Marcus realized, probably thanks to a PR team, probably shouldn't have sent those tweets. So he posts a, uh, an apology, if you will, and because he probably felt like a bit of a fool. And he says, following up on my previous post, I take a lot of pride and dedication uh, and hard work our teammates put forth to make NASCAR the very best it can be. And I shouldn't let social media conversations get personal. So I deleted those posts, except we all screen grabbed them. So they exist forever. Denny Hamlin is a passionate driver and team owner. And I'm truly looking forward to seeing him drive for a championship this year after mocking him twice for not having a championship the night before. Our team is working hard to fix some pavement issues at Sonoma, and we will get it right. Let's keep this positive momentum going in 2024. They are going to get it right. I mean, they're literally repaving entire sections of the track on Thursday night to make sure that they can be able to race this weekend. So hats off to them for finding a solution and getting it done in a very quick manner. So all of that said, Denny co-signed um, Marcus's tweet and says, I'll co-sign this. Definitely take responsibility for my part in it. Got more personal than it should have for sure. Okay. he's He apologized for it getting personal. He did not apologize for what he said about the racetracks, which I think is an interesting point there. The thing is, Denny's not wrong. And I know Denny's always right. That's what his friends tell him, everything like that. Denny's not always right. But in this situation, he is right. He did jump the restart. He was definitely not right about that. In this situation, though, he's very right. Because SMI has had a history of making questionable changes to racetracks, not only through reconfigurations, but also through a number of other things, including putting down traction compound on racetracks and, you know, sometimes telling teams, sometimes not telling teams. Sometimes teams would just show up and be like, oh, oh, we have this going on right now. So just a quick list of a few of the major highlights for what SMI has changed over the last 20 years or so. And let me preface, not all these are bad. Not all of them are bad, and I'll go through the list real quick. We'll start off with Charlotte in 2005 when they levigated the track. If any of you remember watching that back then, absolute banger of a race. One of the longest Coke 600s you could ever have. There were, I think, probably around 20 cautions, if I'm remembering correctly. It was fantastic. It was that sustainable? Absolutely not. So they repaved the track with rubber polymer in the asphalt. And Charlotte hasn't aged in 19 years. If you look at the pavement now, it looks brand new. It looks almost exactly like it did in 2005. That track, I don't think, will ever age. It's impenetrable at this point. Moving on, you have the Bristol Progressive Banking. I actually think that was a great change for Bristol. I know there's a lot of boomers out there, a lot of old head fans that will be like, we need to get back to single lane bottom feeding Bristol. That was really boring. Everybody just romanticizes a couple different things. The new Progressive Banking Bristol, where you can run top, middle, or bottom, I think those races over the last probably 10-ish, 10 plus years for sure have been really, really good. It allows for passing. It allows for more of a dirt track style race where you can have guys run the roll the top, guys roll the bottom, and it's this real back and forth. I really enjoy that. I know some people don't. I'm just throwing it out there. And then you have the Kentucky repave and reconfiguration. In 2016, Kentucky desperately needed a repave. We get it. There were a lot of bumps. There were a lot of weepers. So they repaved it. But they also reprofiled turns one and two. They added three degrees of banking from 14 to 17 degrees and narrowed the racetrack down by like around 15 feet or so. Kentucky wasn't great beforehand, and it certainly was not good afterwards. The thing about racetracks is they need to almost be, in terms of banking, symmetrical at either end. Asking them to have a decent bank corner at one end and a flat corner at the other end and set up for that doesn't really make for good racing. Um, So you can throw that one out there. And then you have the Texas repave and reconfiguration where they went ahead and widened the racetrack going into turns one and two during this most recent repave in 2017. And then they also have changed the banking. Like I just said about Kentucky, make it symmetrical at both ends. Turns three and four at Texas are really, really good. Turns one and two at Texas, really, really bad. Plus all the PJ1 they put down, that track has basically become unraceable. However, it has been a bit of a wild card the last couple of years on the cup schedule. And it'd be interesting to see how it plays out when the cup series visits there this month moving on 
You have the Atlanta reconfiguration. I know there's a ton of drivers that don't love the fact that Atlanta is now a super speedway. A lot of people loved old Atlanta, myself included. Was it the most exciting race every single year? Absolutely not. But do we really need the manufactured drama that you get out of Atlanta now? I don't know. You can make your argument for it. People will say that they saw the best super speedway race that they've ever seen in Atlanta this past uh, March. March? February? February. Got to get my months straight here. And certainly, it had a photo finish. But was it one of the best plate races we've ever seen? Drafting races? I'll still always call them plate races. Uh, No. Top 10, maybe. But definitely not number one. Good finish, though. Exciting finish. But uh, again, I don't know. Atlanta's always had really decent finishes over the years. And you're not guaranteed to get a three-wide finish every year with this. Same way you weren't guaranteed to get a run to the flag with the old one. So, I don't know. Mixed bag. Bristol Dirt. Obviously, this was a big push by the TV network and Fox, as well as SMI for NASCAR to do this. I would argue that it was a bit of a failure. The novelty wore off literally after the first year, and that's why it's not back. Drivers didn't necessarily love it. Stock cars don't belong on dirt. Just another thing to throw out there. And now you have this failed Sonoma repave as well. And then you can throw in all of the marketing gimmicks that drivers probably get annoyed at that SMI does. Um, Eddie Gossage was notoriously not liked amongst mo- a lot of NASCAR drivers for some of the things that he pulled when he was a track president. And there's kind of just a bad taste in driver's mouth when it comes to SMI. So as you can see, there's a lot of things that go into this. Is all of it bad? No, not all of it's bad. But they certainly have made a lot of big mistakes. And when they make mistakes, and Marcus Smith said, hey, we take chances, and they don't always work out. Yeah, but when you take chances, uh, again, hats off. I like when people take chances. I would much rather them take a chance than not take a chance. But when it doesn't work one place, maybe don't do it at the next place. Or if you're going to take a chance, really, really make sure that you think this is going to work because it just hasn't really played out. And if you're going to get 65% of the TV revenue, you have to reinvest in the racetrack. Things have to be painted. Things have to be clean. Every video board has to work. Wi-Fi should not be an issue at racetracks anymore. Daytona, fantastic Wi-Fi. Indianapolis, fantastic Wi-Fi. The last time I was at Kentucky, when it was open in 2019, the worst reception in Wi-Fi you could ever possibly have. So uh, you got to make some changes here, and you got to make some concessions. Denny was right. SMI certainly hasn't been the best. They don't have the best track record. So let me know what you think about the Denny Hamlin drama, about SMI in the comments. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.